our sermon series in the book of Colossians. If you don't have a Bible, there's some on the ends of your rows. Uh, the book of Colossians is in the New Testament, so written after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus by um, the apostles, those who are following Jesus closely and have been given special authority by Jesus, and they write for us the Word of God. And we are six weeks into our sermon series in Colossians. If you need to use the table of contents, there's no shame in that. I use it all the time. You can also Google Colossians chapter 2. And we're actually going to be in the same passage that we preached last week. There's just so much in it that we thought we'd do two weeks in a row. So if you, if you weren't here last week, I really highly recommend that you go back online, either through the Sedaris app or um, at sedariuschurch.com, or we have an iTunes podcast, so you can subscribe to that and hear uh, last week's sermon, because these two really go together. Let's pray real quick, settle our hearts and minds so that we might listen well. Heavenly Father, thank you for the space, for these people, and most importantly for your word that you have given to us, that we might know you, know ourselves, and love and serve all of creation. We pray now that you would silence our minds from any distraction that you'd allow us to sit in the Spirit so that we might hear your word well. And help us not just to hear it well, but to be doers of the word and to go from this place and to be ambassadors of reconciliation and resurrection in our neighborhoods, on our streets, in our workplace, and in our city, God. We pray now that you would come and be here with my words and their ears, that we might bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. The, world, the world's a bit binary. So I'm going to make some generalizations about two kinds of people. And so you can think back to high school, and, and, and that sort of was helpful for me as I was thinking about this. There tends to be sort of good boys and girls and bad boys and girls. And we tend to sort of drop into one of these binary identities in one way or another. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying everybody's exactly the same. I'm just saying within every different personality type, billion times over, there tends to be these two types of categories. So our identities tend to be, are we rule followers, which I call legalists, law followers, or are we rebels, law breakers? And because of that, there tends to be two types of philosophies that rise up in the world. These two types of philosophies can be categorized as ascetic, ascetic philosophies, A E or A-S-C-E-T-I-C, or hedonistic. Ascetic meaning I sort of beat myself into submission, or hedonistic meaning I feed myself and indulge in the pleasures of the world. And all philosophies can tend to be broken down into those two categories because there's generally two kinds of people. And this then leads to two types of religion. Religion can be rule-based or religion can be um, sensation-based or experience-based. Now, here's the thing we'll see today. Neither type of religion can save you. Religion cannot save Religion will not save, no matter which form of it you are more drawn to. Look at the very beginning of the passage, chapter 2, verse 6. Does it feel a little bit boomy? Are we echoing a little bit? Sorry, I'm just getting a little bit of feedback. Okay. Okay. The very beginning, verse, chapter 2, the big number, verse 8, the little number. See to it that no one 
takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition. See to it is, in the Greek, an imperative, meaning the, the rest of what we'll say today, this is your task. This is the one thing that you have to just try to do, which is not be taken captive. Okay? Because religion can and will lead you ultimately astray. It is dangerous. What we'll say is the gospel of grace, that's where life is found. Only that can save you. But religion, with various forms and and ways of moving in the world, even within the church, it's dangerous. Now, there's a really interesting story in the Old Testament that I just stumbled upon this week. I wasn't looking for it. I just got reading it, and I thought this is a great, uh, a great warning story about religion, and it's the story of Dinah. Do you know who Dinah is? Probably not. Dinah is the daughter of Jacob, and Jacob's name was eventually changed by God to Israel, and he's the father of the entire nation of Israel, and his daughter was out one day. Sort sort of probably beyond the bounds of where maybe she should have been. Kind of checking out the neighboring people groups and tribes. And it's a tragic story. A young man named Shechem sees her and sees that she's beautiful and goes. And from what we can tell from the Hebrew text, forces himself upon her and rapes her. Now, if you were in that time... For a young woman who was not married to lose her virginity, this was a huge deal. And Shechem actually did love this woman. He wanted to marry her. And so Shechem goes and his father go to Jacob and say, let's join our families together. Your daughter now, is, is, it's going to be hard for her to be married. Shechem is, has fallen in love with her. And he wants to marry her. Let's bring our families together. That way she can uh, live a good, normal life. And and this family had wealth and land and, and animals. And maybe this is the only way forward. And so Jacob and his sons Levi and Simeon say, Okay, Dad, let's do this. Let's join with them. And so they say to them, Levi and Simeon, Dinah's brothers, here's what you need to do if you want to join with our family, because our people group, this is part of our religious ritual to mark ourselves off from other tribes. Circumcision. So they say, they think about it, and they say, The entire tribe, all the men of your tribe must be circumcised. If you don't know what circumcision is, that's okay. (laughs) Okay. All your grown men, okay? Everybody. And so they say, we really want to be united with this people. We see something special in this people group. Our two tribes could be one. And so they say, okay, we'll do it. Circumcision. Well, Levi and Simeon weren't quite honest. And as the story goes, all the men of Shechem's tribe, all their warriors are circumcised. And the next day, while they are recovering, so to speak, Levi and Simeon take the tribe of Israel's army, and they march upon the people, and they conquer and pillage and steal all that is Shechem's tribe. And I thought, man, that is a great warning story for how religion often works. Beware of people who say, by these rituals, 
by these practices, by these experiences, you can be united. Because honestly, a lot of people's motives that are pushing religion are not good. Now you got to wrestle with, <laughs> okay, Levi and Simeon are part of the people of God and, and they've done this thing, they've tricked this neighboring tribe. But religion can be dangerous. Doing anything just to become in the crowd. So I want to read now for us our text today. The whole thing. And then we'll look deeper at the perils of both types of religion. Verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Last week, if you're here with us, what we said is behind every philosophy, behind every movement or ideology or system of belief, behind every human-made religion, I believe, if it has juice, we said, if it gets to the point where you know about it, if it gets to the point where it's influencing people, where it has a following, where it has bumper stickers, there is probably an elemental spirit moving behind it. An elemental spirit here means enemies of God, spiritual beings that move it along. We don't know exactly how that works, but this is the constant witness of Scripture, is that there is a spiritual realm in which there are people, personal beings who are opposed to God. That's what he's talking about, the elemental spirits of the world. And oftentimes we don't even know that that is happening. And last week what we said was that these elemental spirits who move these philosophies of the day and the age, these religious systems, they are often going to take you captive. Later we'll see in the text, pass judgment upon you if you don't follow their precepts, and they will make you submit. So what this means is peer pressure, shaming you, bullying you into doing what their philosophy or ideology, or religion says. That is the way these ideas and movements begin. Okay, so listen to that as we read through it. For in him, verse 9, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him, that's Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. We'll talk about that passage more on at Baptism Sunday. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all your trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Here's what he's saying. And even think, even think back to our story of Dinah and Levi and Simeon and Shechem. What he's saying is, these man-made works of religion, you don't need them anymore because you've experienced a spiritual circumcision. You have been cleansed of your trespasses against God that led to death, and now you've been made alive with God through the resurrection applied to you because you are connected to Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of grace. That's the good news. Your debt has been canceled. So any religion or system of thinking that says, unless you do this, unless you think this way, unless you participate in this way, unless you experience this, all of those things are false religion or false ideology, false philosophy, because it is a finished work in Christ. Your debt, your arrest warrant, so to speak, has been nailed to the cross with Jesus. That's the gospel of grace. Let's keep reading. Verse 16, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you, no peer pressure, in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or to a new moon, 
or to a Sabbath. Here's the first type of religion. These were Jewish religious rituals that now the New Testament church no longer has to do because of the finished work of Christ. Christ has fulfilled these parts of the Old Testament, and therefore, to be a Christian does not mean that you need to be circumcised or follow kosher laws or keep the um, Jewish festivals or even the Jewish Sabbath day. That's what Paul's saying. But people will pressure you, and that's what was happening in the church in Colossae. People were pressuring these new young Christians to become fully Jewish in all the religious accoutrement of the Jewish people. Paul's saying, no. Now look at verse 17. Why don't they? Because these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Here's what he's saying. We talked about this on Easter. These rituals, these festivals, these kosher laws, keeping yourself pure and separate from the surrounding tribes, circumcision even, was a way of, of, it was a shadow of what was coming in Christ, is that you have been set apart, is that you are different, is that this is what the Jewish people did, and it was not bad then, but now, because of the finished work of Christ, all you need is Christ. He is the substance of which these other religious Rules and rituals and festivals were just shadows. So you have the real thing, not the shadow. And so you don't need to add the shadow because you have the real thing. That's what he's saying. So it's one type. Now look, now he shifts a little bit and he talks about another kind of religion. Verse 18. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Seems almost here like he's pinpointing a specific individual within the community who was teaching these things. And not holding fast to the head. Who's the head? That's Christ, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. You see this slightly different type of religious expression This is the second type that Paul says. You don't need that either, which is asceticism, worship of angels, seeking visions. Now, this could be related to things that were happening in the Jewish community. These are called called Hellenistic Jewish communities because they're in the Greek Empire, the formerly Greek Empire, which is now the Roman Empire. Colossae was in what is now Asia, or what is now Turkey, which is called Asia Minor back then. And so there was some syncretism that had happened, and probably some of these things Paul's referencing are parts of, of old pagan Greek religion that had worked its way, maybe kind of becoming Jewish in a sense, and now it's working its way into the church. But this idea where he says going on in detail about visions, probably a better translation is entering into visions, which would have been an initiation rite right of a local mystery religion in that part of the world. And so Paul's saying, you don't need that either. You don't need to seek this kind of religious experience. Now let's read the rest of the text, starting verse 20. If, with Christ, you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to their regulations? They say things, for instance, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish when they are used according to human precepts and teachings. Now, look at this, verse 23. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgences of the flesh. Here's what Paul's saying, and this is so important. In Colossae, Now, in 2019, other religions and philosophies and ideologies, they have some value. Meaning, people don't follow them for no reason. They have an appearance of wisdom. And I'd say not just an appearance of wisdom, but they actually help people get along in this world. Right? They're like Snickers. Right? Hungry? Why wait? The only reason that commercial works is because a Snickers bar will help. (laughs) Okay? For a moment. But 
if all you do every time you feel hungry is eat a Snickers bar, in the long run, it will leave you wanting. But there's a reason. People turn to these things. They're both intellectually satisfying to some degree. They make sense of the world. And they're existentially satisfying to some degree. That's why people practice other religions, follow other philosophies. And here, specifically what he's talking about, things within the church that seem Christian-y, right? Like it's really hard to tell how they're not Christianity because they're, they're sort of jamming on Christian themes and ideas. And so you, you say to yourself, is that the gospel of grace? Is that Christianity? I think so, or maybe that's the only thing you've ever heard. And Paul's saying like, I know that it's not obviously wrong, but you need to. Your job is to try to figure out, is it the Spirit of God behind that system of thinking, behind that religious practice, or is that the elemental spirits of the world or human wisdom propping up this system? This is so important. In America, right now, in this city, right now, you will find both types of what I would call errorist thinking within the church, or even types of churches. The first, those that, that, that really focus on rules and practices, rituals, festivals, we call this a legalistic church. <clears throat> you must not miss Mass, because it's the bread and the wine that saves you. If you grew up in a Catholic tradition, sometimes that's what is expressed. You must be baptized in order to be a true Christian. What you're saying is baptism saves you. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that baptism is a reenactment of what God has already done by His grace through the Spirit. Legalistic churches will say, maybe you grow up like this, you must not drink alcohol. <clears throat> you must not become drunk. What are they saying? Actions save you. Or specific non-actions save you. Other churches like this would say, you must pray, or other religions even, you must pray this many times per day if you are going to be a true believer. <clears throat> What are they saying? Prayer saves you. Now on the other side, you have churches. Thank you. Yes, this is my man right here, Joshua. Well, thanks to everybody. <laughs> okay. These would be maybe churches that focus on the experiential. We would call this sensationalist churches. They might say something like this. If you've not been baptized by the Holy Spirit, a special second baptism of the Spirit, you're not saved. What are they saying? The baptism of the Spirit saves you. Now we should want to be filled with the Spirit again and again, but it does not save you. They could say certain particular spiritual gifts are a sign that you're saved. Speaking in tongues, seeing visions, having dreams, being able to speak prophecy, interpret prophecy, again, what they're saying is that a particular spiritual gift saves you. And that is not the gospel of grace. Now, I'm not trying to be harsh on other churches because there are things within our community that have risen to the level where some of you might believe if you do not join a cohort, you will not be saved. <laughs> that is not true. <clears throat> we just believe those <laughs> are good things. Now, both of these, focusing on rules and practices, focusing on experiences, both are forms of human religious error that creep into churches, good churches, churches that love Jesus and want to see his kingdom come and people come to know God. But the religious error is this, seeking varying forms of the same end, which is, which is what? Which is self-validation. That's what makes both kinds of religions so popular. If I, 
if I do these things, if I have these experiences, I can know, I can validate myself. Which is so contrary to the gospel of grace, which says you have no power to validate yourself. You are validated only by the grace of God and his work through his son Jesus on the cross and by the resurrection. But it's powerful. It's so powerful. But if you follow these religions of the day rather than the gospel of grace, you will lack something very important. Look at the very last verse of the text. It says this. These indeed have the appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in what? I said they have some value, but what do they have no value in? Stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now, this can be very specifically like if I just say, you know, alcohol is bad and, and drinking alcohol is bad and that's what my religion says and so I don't do it, I don't do it, I do, don't do it. The reality is eventually that white knuckling will fall short. So that, that, that's a one level of this that eventually it will, the, the flesh will press through and you'll fall short if, if you're white knuckling it because your religion says so. But on another level, it's even bigger than that. If you remember our overall theme of Colossians, what we've said is you have a misunderstanding of how heaven and earth work. They're not just these two separate realities. Actually, heaven is everything. Heaven is God's presence. And, and how the Bible talks about heaven is it's his full presence, which is why it's so exciting, the idea that one day we'll get to be in heaven with God. Because his full presence is there. And then, if this is the full circle, right here is a little circle, and that's the cosmos. That's the created world, and universe, and stars, everything. So it's big. So I'm not saying this is like galaxies and stuff. I'm saying all that's right here in this little spot that God created. And that spot rebelled against God through sin. And sin led to separation, so God's full presence could no longer be in his created world, though, though he can still be here and is still here, but his full presence still waits to be inaugurated. And how is he doing that? It's through Christ Jesus, who is the Son of God. You've got to go back and listen to the other sermons in the series. It'll make a lot more sense. The Son of God, who puts on flesh, uniting himself with creation, saying, it is not bad, I am not done with it, but I am redeeming it. I am fixing it, and I'm fixing it because I'm sending heaven to earth so that all things might be made new so that heaven and earth can be reunited together. That's, the, that's at the very end of the Bible. That's the vision we have for the goodness. It's the new heaven and the new earth, God's full presence reigning with all creation, including human beings who have repented and believed that it's only in Christ, okay? So, we have to admit that there's value in religion, but religion will only tell you that with your system or your ritual or your practices or your moral actions or your mystical experiences, you can have heaven either in the future, that's focusing on scorecards, did I do well enough in this life to get to go to that heaven, or they'll say you can have heaven now, which tends to be sensationalist religion, which says you don't need to wait, you can have it now. But I would argue with you, both of those are only giving you part of what God promises you in Christ. Because the gospel of grace says this. The gospel says, with Christ, with Christ, with Christ, with Christ, with Christ, you can have heaven, which is the full presence of God. You can have that now, and you can have that in the future. Now, How can that be? How can it be? How can it be? Do you know where I'm going with this? How can it be? Take a look here. Verse 9. For in him, that's Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. That which before creation was non-material and spoke material world into existence, now puts on a body, and the full deity dwells in him. That's why you can have 
heaven now and heaven in the future. That's why you don't need religion anymore to try to get you halfway. In Christ, you've gone the whole way. You see it? Look at verse 17. These are a shadow, speaking of these man-made religious things, of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Same idea. So how do you know? How do you know if the things that you're doing, even as a Christian, the Christian practices, the things that your church does, how do you know if those things are man-made religious systems, ideas, and rituals, or if they're things worth pursuing? How do you know if they have real value? How do you know? How do you know? Here's the big filter. Does it ultimately lead to the apprehension, meaning a stronger bond with, and the centralization, moving it into the middle of your life, of who? Christ Jesus. If it doesn't do that, it's man-made religion, and you can flush it. And you should probably raise it up the flagpole. Why, 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 why do we do that? Why, why, why do we do that? Why do we make such a big deal of that? It's not helping to the apprehension and the centralization of Christ Jesus. Because that's the only thing, it's the only thing that connects heaven and earth together that brings the full presence of God into your life, which is what we should all want. Now you say, Dave, come on, I know this stuff. I know that religion doesn't save. I'm a millennial. I know this. I know this stuff. I know that religion doesn't save me. This is not my problem. Listen to me. This is your problem. Why? Because you are a human being. It's every human being's problem. At least one of these. Tendency towards loving the rules or tendency towards loving the experience. And probably both. It's both for me. Weekly, I have to take notice of my life. Am I elevating something other than the gospel of grace to the place of highest importance? I'm both. Okay, so how do you know? If you're a rule ritual tender, you will know that you're chasing religious perfectionism or legalism if... When you fall short and misstep, you swing to the other extreme. And your identity is shaken. Who am I? I fell short. Who am I? Oh my gosh. Who am I? Let me give you an illustration. Say you believe that getting drunk is wrong. Which it is, okay? Say, for much of your life, you were so good at following that command, thou shall not get drunk. And then one night, one drink turns to two, two turns to three, three turns to four, four turns to five, and the, and the, and the ceiling is spinning, and you're wondering, oh my gosh, and you wake up the next day, and you are shaken to the core, and so you know what you do? Next weekend... I'm going to go do it again. I've already lost my perfect record. Maybe you've been taught that having sex before marriage is not God's will for your life. And maybe you fall short of that. And you're so cut to the core that you don't know how to move forward with God. You think that he's abandoned you. You say, maybe it was all for naught. Friends, these are real things. And they're hard things, but they should not change your identity. Because if that has been your experience and you just double down on the sin, or your identity is so shaken to the core you don't know how to move forward, it just means 
by the grace of God, that it's highlighted the fact that you've put your value in self-effort or your value in the perception of your community and not in the gospel of grace. Because, you see, the gospel proclaims that your value sources from the finished work of Christ, that it has all been nailed to the cross, that there is nothing that you can do now that separates you from the love of God. That is your value. Moreover, your perception in this community or any community of the gospel should be this. Ready? You can hear what I'm saying? Your, your perception in every community should be this. I am a sinner in need of the grace of God. Guess what doesn't change that? You slip up. You fall short. Because your value, your perception, it remains totally unchanged. Praise be to God if right now you're having an experience where you're like, oh my goodness, I have elevated man-made religion where it did not belong. Thank you, Paul, for reminding us that the finished work of Christ is enough. Here's the other potential slip. Experience or sensation is put above or next to the finished work of Christ. How can I know if I'm doing that? You know you're chasing religious experience or, or by that significance if when you are not experiencing mystical mountaintop moments, you become depressed, spiritually depressed, and you begin to question your own salvation. If, if that's you, you know, you should be thinking right now, maybe I've put too much stock in these religious things. If your identity is shaken, if it's been a long drought of a mountaintop moment. You know, somebody might say to you, when's the last time? Maybe you've had this experience of hearing the audible voice of God. You say, when is the last, they ask you, when's the last time you heard God speak? And you say, I don't know. And you get so shaken in your core and you begin to question, does God still talk? Maybe you hear of somebody else's mountaintop moment. Maybe somebody else has an experience of hearing God's voice or exercising certain spiritual gifts that, that you desire to have. And instead of rejoicing with them, deep down in your heart, because you probably won't ever show them this, in your heart is envy and anger towards God. Them? You let them hear your voice? What about me? This is just a tip-off. It's just a tip-off because the truth is, look at, look at verses 9 and 10. In him, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him. That is not a future tense. It is once you receive Christ by faith, you are filled. You are filled with he who has the whole deity in bodily form by his spirit. You are now alive together with God. So you're lacking nothing. You are having, even in a dry season, even if it's been a while since you had a, a, a big religious experience, you are lacking nothing. You have Christ. He's all you need. Now, again, this is not to beat you up. It's to free you. This is a place of freedom, just like we sung. It's freedom to know this because religious systems will build things up that should not be built up. The only thing that should be built up is the finished work of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel of grace. Uh, do I got time for this? What do you think? <laughs> okay. Last week I said, I always think there's time. Last week I said, pay attention to your growl. Because see, somebody tries to take something from you and you growl. Whoa. You know, you know that thing has value in your mind. So here, if you're, if you're sort of prone to legalism or religious rule following, how do I know if I'm becoming captive to this form of religion? I'm, now I'm talking Christian forms here. Listen, if, if when somebody asks you the question on a borderline morality issue, 
For instance, back to my drinking, you've had two glasses of wine and somebody that you trust and love and know and that you know that they have your best interest in mind says to you, hey, do you think that's enough? If in your soul you growl, you got a problem. And your problem is not necessarily that you have a drinking problem. Your problem is that you have said not getting drunk is in some way your salvation. You see that? And that's why you're growling at this person. Maybe somebody says, should you be watching that show? Is that really edifying to you? Should you be watching that? If your soul growls, again, it's because you have maybe thought that your identity lied in being a good person and they're questioning whether you're making good choices. Because, see, the question from a trustworthy friend or brother or sister in Christ should be taken as this, helpful potential advice. If you are secure in your salvation in Christ alone. And so that growl just is a tip-off that maybe you think being good or being good enough is what saves you. It isn't. If religious mysticism or experience is the thing that you tend to kind of slip into, when you, if you growl when somebody questions the supernaturality of an experience, it might be a tip-off. So let's say you have a dream, and in the dream there's doves, like birds, and they fly. And you have this dream, and there's birds. And, and you come back and you tell a friend that you trust and you know loves the Lord, you tell them, uh, listen, I had a dream with these doves, and I went and I looked up where Dove Soap, what its parent company is, and so I bought like 100 shares of stock in Unilever, and the stock rose 25%. And you say, I think God gave me that dream. Or maybe you're not into stocks and bonds. You have a dream about doves flying up, and so you change soaps. And then that girl that you've always liked says, wow, you smell nice today. Did you do something different? And you're like, God, <laughs> thank you, God, thank you, thank you. And you go and you tell your friend this. And your friend says to you, maybe. <laughs> or, or, or maybe it's that, remember, like, the night before you had that dream, we were watching that old Prince video. You know that one? When doves cry? <laughs> really great video. I looked it up, by the way. Uh, maybe that's why you had that dream. If he, and, and here's the thing. He might be wrong, and you might be right. It might have been God sending you a vision or a dream to change something or to do something, but the very fact that he's questioning it for you means, and you growl at it, means that subconsciously you've rooted your worth in the tangible experience of God speaking to you through visions and dreams. Because the whole idea that somebody would take that away from you makes you growl. You see that? Does, does that make sense, what I'm, what I'm saying here? Again, it doesn't mean those people are right or that one more glass of wine will make you drunk or that that dream wasn't sent to you by God for some reason. It just means that you have that reaction and you can't just sit and say, I wonder, is that good advice? Is, is, is he, maybe, maybe there's something to it. Maybe I shouldn't overhype the, you know, the dream. If, if that's, it's just tipping you off that maybe you've added something to the finished work of Christ. And this is all just to highlight the fact that this happens and that religion can't save you. Only Christ Jesus our Lord can. Rule following can't save you. Moralism can't save you. Rituals can't save you. Festivals can't save you. Religious experiences can't save you. Mystical experiences can't save you. None of this can save you, but religion will try to tell you it can. And they're selling you a bill of goods. And they're going to come and ransack your village and ransack your home and take you captive. And you thought you were just being a good Christian. You will forget this. You will add things to Jesus. You will be at times taken captive. Others will convince you to seek something in addition to Christ. This will happen. You will be influenced. You will stray. And now if in your mind you're thinking, what have I done? Again, you've missed the point. That you will experience these things changes nothing about you in the sight of God. Whatever you feel in your gut when you realize that maybe you've been taken captive, 
that maybe the voice of elemental spirits or hollow human wisdom has taken you to a place that God did not want to take you, listen, it's okay. Christ has already saved you from that. Christ has already died for that. Christ has already risen from the grave so that you might walk in a new life after that. Listen, don't fall into the same thing I just said when you hear that maybe I've been taken captive. You see this? The gospel of grace says it is finished. It is finished. Your arrest warrant is nailed to the cross for once and for all, and there's nothing you can do to lose the presence of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is remarkable that you have done for us these things, that you, even knowing that we would hear the truth, come to the truth, begin to follow you, and then add things to you like they could save us, that you have already known that and loved us despite of that and continue to love us and never change, that is remarkable. And all we can do when we hear that is not try harder, not seek religious experience. All we can do in that is thank you, acknowledge you, worship you with every ounce of our being because we know that's what we were created to do. Respond to your goodness, your faithfulness, and your grace in our lives today, tomorrow, and for all eternity. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.